Good morning, everybody. Well, that video is sort of a plug for Wild Church. Uh, it is Earth Month now. So, yes, if you did not know, every month is a thing. And this month is Earth Month. Started yesterday. And so I want to invite you, if you did not know or you forgot, um, maybe your pants, you can just quickly unzip this and they could become shorts, you know. That's the ultimate Sunday, you know, attire for Wild Church. Whatever it is, I just want to invite you. We're going to um, go up to Catalina State Park after this. So we're going to meet there at 1145 at the trailhead. And this is a great opportunity uh, for us to be in nature and receive from nature. Um, and I, I'm just going to trade this hat for this, you know. So I have, I have, I'm ready. I'm like, I'm prepared, you know. But, uh, <sighs> yeah. Speaking of this hat, I, um, my mom uh, was in town a couple months ago, and we went to this local market, and I saw this hat, and I thought, I need my first official Tucson hat. And, uh, and then I got the hat, and then I was like, Mom, I don't know if the world's ready for me in the hat, you know. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. And she said, you got to make them ready. You know, you got to just do it and the world will adapt, you know. So that's what today is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we were, actually, I don't know if you, um, you've you seen, if you live in Oro Valley or Marana, um, there was an article that came about uh, about Aldea in Oro Valley style. Oh, I only mention it, though, because I wasn't sure if anyone is here today because of that article. Um, because I feel bad that the article didn't mention anything about the hat. And I just wanted to warn you, like, <laughs> if you're showing up, like, I wasn't warned about the hat, you know? So I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, when we go into nature, we receive something from it. We receive kind of a peace and a stillness, and we receive a bit of what I like to think of as the flow. You know, we kind of, what nature is speaks to us. But if you look really closely at the flow, there's a pattern and I find that it's a sacred pattern, a pattern of death and rebirth. And it's something that we also see really prevalent in the Easter story. And so this really is the beginning today of, of our Easter experience. But I do want to invite you next week. We have a lot of fun things planned. And so I want to encourage you to come and to invite those that you love, those in your community, because we're going to be meeting at 9 a.m. for breakfast. It's going to be amazing. And then at 10 a.m., we're going to have service and Easter egg hunt. So I want to invite you to that. But really, today is the beginning of a two-part message that will culminate on Easter. And this message is called Road to Resurrection. Because in order to get to resurrection, there's a bit of a journey that we go on. You know, Sunday we think of as Resurrection Day. But there's also Friday, and there's also Saturday, okay? And how do we get from Friday to Sunday? And so I want to go on that journey with you starting today. See, resurrection, rebirth, renewal, reawakening, all the re words, you know, they represent a journey because re means again, right? And so there's birth, and then there's rebirth. But what about what's all of that in between? What's the journey that we go on in between? The word resurrect actually comes from this Latin root word, re, sergere. And the sergere part is the same as the root word in surge. So essentially, this word that resurrection comes from, surge means to rise. So, so to resurrect is to rise again. And really inherent in this word is this journey to rise, to fall, and rise again. And we tend to really like the rising parts, and we don't so much like to look at the fall and to recognize how important the fall is, right? We love a comeback story, but none of us actually want to experience the rock bottom part. And yet in the Easter story, we see Jesus doesn't resist he doesn't pick and choose. He says yes to everything, to all of it. Yet, in my own life, in my own journey, and especially in my faith, I've often rushed to the resurrection part. I often skip over the other parts and try to go straight to resurrection. 
I know growing up, I saw, res- I saw like the Jesus resurrection story in some ways. It was like his grand finale miracle. It's like he, he did water into wine, you know. I mean, that one's cool. And then he did, he did a, you know, he fed the 5,000. He's like, for my final and greatest trick, I'm going to, re-. and that's, that's honestly how I kind of felt. Like, well, and if he did that, okay, that's, then we're good. But, you know, as life has continued, what I find even more profound is that we see the divine present in the fall, present in the failure, in the loss, in the unknowing, in the doubt. And even beyond that, we might ask the question, what if that part is crucial to the whole thing? I see this pattern, and, and I can't help but see it all over the place, this pattern of death and rebirth. And I just want to be clear, when I'm talking about death, in a lot of ways it's a metaphor for endings, that there are, we're surrounded by endings and beginnings. Now, there are many stories and many journeys in this room. Some of you may be facing small endings. Some of you may be facing big endings. So I want to create space for that and just let you know I recognize all the different stories in this room. So it, so it can be true for us on so many different levels. But let's just take a look at some of the ways in our own lives and in the world around us that we see this pattern. Think about our bodies for a second. But even right now, as you are sitting in this room, just in the past handful of minutes, Billions of cells have died, and billions of cells have been born in your body. And in fact, disease or unhealth in our bodies is often when this process is not happening, when there isn't a death and a rebirth as it should be happening. Look at our planet. Look at how this cycle of death and rebirth is inherent in the pattern of how the earth sustains itself. And in some ways, some of the great ecological problems that we face today are a result of us turning away from this pattern, of us taking and taking from the earth and not giving, not respecting this sacred pattern. Look at the life cycle of plants and animals. You know, plants, in their death, they sow seeds, and those seeds come to life, and they continue the cycle. Or we look at the food chain, and we kind of look at it from afar. If you look really close at the food chain, it can be really chaotic, and we think, like, oh, my gosh, nature is pretty brutal. But from a, from a zoomed-out perspective, there is a harmony in the food chain. You know, we have the producers, the plants, the consumers, us, right? And then there's the decomposers, and this is this is the the part of nature that we don't often like to look at. Like we all, we, you know, a lot of us have plants. Maybe you, you think of your plants as a pet. I know, I know people in my life that are like, this is my plant Jenny. You know what I mean? It's like a real thing. And we certainly, all of us have pets or, or we have, you know, we've had experience with pets. But yet the decomposers are the things that we're probably least likely to keep as pets, you know? Like I don't know any of you that has like a pet bacteria Maybe some of you have pet insects, but you, no one's told me about that, you know. Definitely don't have, like, a pet fungus, you know, unless you're growing mushrooms. But <laughs> you're like, yeah, I am. But see, the, these parts of, of nature, the creepy crawlies, the, in some ways these, like, darker parts are actually fundamental to the health of the whole thing. See, the decomposers, they break down that which is dead, that which has become waste, and they turn it into nutrients. They turn it into life. They give it back to the soil. They are such a good example of death being turned into life. And just like we turn away from the decomposers in nature, we often turn away from the decomposition in our own lives. Look at the seasons. Like, my favorite season for you know, much of my life. Now that I live in Arizona, I don't know. I'm going to have to change my favorite season because everything's topsy-turvy for me at this point. But for most of my life, my favorite season has been autumn. I find autumn to be so beautiful. 
But yet when you look around and you see the orange, yellow, the red leaves falling from the trees in their splendor, you're also watching an ending. And there's a beauty in that ending. But if it weren't for that ending, for those leaves to fall, for those leaves to die, for those leaves to go back into the soil, we wouldn't have the beautiful season that we're in now. We wouldn't have spring, where we're surrounded in new beginnings. And I'm curious if we can recognize this experience in our own lives. You know, those moments where we face an ending. Maybe it was the end of a relationship or a marriage. And there was so much grief and so much loss. But looking back now, you can see that there was a spring to come. There was some way in which that painful moment could become something beautiful in your life. Maybe it was a job that you lost. And yet it was only through losing that job that you were able to discover that there were other dreams wanting to be born in your life. There was a church I worked at a handful of years ago where I met a wonderful man named Daryl. And when I met Daryl, he had been living for a number of years with the diagnosis of Parkinson's. And we would have all these conversations, and I would ask him, you know, I'd, once I got to know him and we built some trust, I would really ask him, what has your experience been? Like, what was it like to be at the top of your field as an engineer and then you're forced into early retirement because of this diagnosis? And I never forget what he said to me. You know, he said, before you met me, before this diagnosis, I think of that person as Daryl 1.0. And yeah, he was at the top of his field. He was, he was leading a company as an engineer. But at the same time, he wasn't very nice to his wife. And he saw his employees as means to an end. And after the diagnosis is Daryl 2.0. And that was the Daryl that I knew. So sweet, so gentle, so calm. And, and he would say, you know, I wouldn't change anything. Because I love Daryl 2.0. What if we could develop an awareness for when we're in the autumn of our lives, these seasons that we continually go through? What if we could see in our own lives when some leaves are starting to turn orange and we could say, okay, I see what's coming. We're on our way to winter. But what if we could believe for and recognize that there is a spring to come? What if we could even invite that? I think in a lot of times, In our lives, we have to go through this process of really recognizing when we need to bring on that change. I think of this as pruning. For those of you that garden, you know you have to prune. You have to cut back in certain areas so other things can grow. This is us being active in the process of inviting change in our own lives, accepting when changes come. And realizing that sometimes we have to let some things go, we have to let some parts of our lives die in order for others to prosper. I wonder, from that lens, have you ever pruned? I don't mean like a diet where you ate only prunes. I mean like, (laughs) I was actually thinking about that this week. I ate a lot of prunes as a kid, but where do they go? Like I haven't seen prunes in 10, 20 years. Like do they still, are they still a thing? I liked it. I don't know. I need to get some prunes. <laughs> but have you pruned in your life, recognizing, look, not everything in my world can flourish simultaneously. Maybe you're in a situation where you're thinking, I don't know if I can give 100% of my heart and my life to my family and be giving 100% at my job. I just don't think I can do both. That's okay. You're like, I'm going to choose my job. No, I mean, they, you know, they <laughs> but it's like there are times we have to let go. We have to cut back. Maybe you feel like you're in the crossroads of two dreams and part of you knows I'm not going to be able to fully give myself to both. There was a time in my life a handful of years ago where I was doing ministry And I also had the opportunity to be in a band and 
this band was more successful than I had anticipated it would be. At first, it started out like this would just be fun. These are cool people, and I like playing music. And it got to a point where it was starting to get pretty serious, and it was more successful than anything I had ever been in. And so I was really wondering, like, what is this going to look like in my life? And it got to a point where I started to feel like, you know, I mean, if you play music, like, there's a part of you that's kind of like in the back of your mind is like, I still want to be a rock star a little bit. But I started to realize, okay, this path would take 100%. But yet, I just love being with people in spiritual community. I love the transformation that happens. I love the conversations that we get to have. And that was a part of my life that was blossoming as well. And I came to a point where I realized I can't live my life trying to give my full self to both of these things, at least right now. And so I decided to continue down this path. And there's always a letting go. It doesn't mean that there isn't a loss there. But I can see in my own life how much healthier this path is because I'm not stuck between two. You know, in the Hindu tradition, they have a trinity, just like there is in a Christian tradition. It's not exactly the same, but we, the way in which we look at the God figure through the lens of three, this also shows up in the Hindu trinity. And the Hindu trinity is Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Now, it's interesting for us because we look at the destroyer and we think, how, how could that be a part of the character of God? How could that be a picture, an image of the divine, the destroyer? And yet together, the three represent a cycle of creation. Shiva, in a sense, is the, is the great pruner. Because if it weren't for this aspect, there wouldn't be any space left to create. There wouldn't be anything to preserve. Sometimes there needs to be a little bit of pruning. There needs to be something that aids the process of decomposition so that other things, new things, can be born. What if recognizing the Shiva energy in your life is to look at these moments when things look like they're falling apart, and instead of resisting it, we accept it. We maybe even invite it because we see that it's part of a larger cycle happening in our life. I know this was true for me even when it came to religion. There were moments in my life where I needed to let old understandings of religion go. And there were even times where I needed to grieve that understanding, that old framework. But it was in making space, it was in allowing that old belief system to die that there was space created for something new to fill it. When we look at Jesus, we see that he said yes to this process. And there's a really crucial moment where we see him truly grappling with this choice. It's a story in all four Gospels, which just to give you a little context, the virgin birth story doesn't even show up in all four Gospels. So it's like this story clearly is very crucial to our understanding of Jesus. And this is the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's right before his arrest. And we see that he's facing inner turmoil. He's grappling with all that's to come. And we see in Matthew 26, verse 42, he says this. He's in, he's in a moment of prayer. He's left the disciples, um, and he's, he's gone off on his own. He's in a moment of prayer, and he says, Father, if there's no other way for this cup to pass without my drinking it, then not my will but yours be done. We all are given cups in life that we don't want to drink. You might be thinking, I didn't ask to be laid off. I didn't ask for this disability. I didn't ask for this relationship to end. And I think what we see in this passage is that it's okay to grapple with that. It's okay to say, you know what? This sucks. I don't want to be going through this experience. He's appealing to the divine saying, look, I don't really want this but I can accept it. And then we see right after this, he returns to his disciples. He says, again, Jesus returned to his disciples and found them asleep. Their eyes were heavy-lidded. So Jesus left them again and returned to prayer, praying the same sentiments with the same words. 
Again, he returned to his disciples. And he said, well, you're still sleeping. Are you getting a good long rest? Jesus is a little cheeky. He's a little salty, you know. He's going through some stuff, and I love it. We see he's like, he's got the sarcasm, you know. He's like, oh, are you sleeping? You're rest- are, you, are you well rested? I'm, a- I'm about to get arrested, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've got one more. <laughs> he looked at his disciples, and he was like, Jesus Christ. I mean, me. (laughs) All right, I'm canceled. Sorry. (laughs) So Jesus gets arrested. And in that moment, the authorities come, the Roman soldiers come. Judas, you know, we know the story. Judas comes. Jesus is arrested. And Peter, his disciple, draws a sword as if to say no. This cannot happen. I'm going to resist this. And we see in John chapter 18, verse 11, Jesus says to Peter, put down your sword and return it to the sheath. Am I to turn away from the cup the Father has given me to drink? Sometimes I wonder what Peter's plan was in this moment. Like he must have thought he was Rambo or something. Like he's one, he's a, fi- he's a guy, he was like an ex-fisherman. No, he's a full-time, you know, he's in ministry. Like, those of us in ministry, we're not like, you know. I mean, like, I don't know what he was, you know. (laughs) Some people are. There's some, like, jacked, you know. But I don't know what his plan was. But I wonder how often in life we approach things like Peter. Pain comes. Challenge comes. And we're like, nope, not going to happen. We draw our swords. And Jesus' invitation in this moment is to say, put down your sword. Let go of the resistance. Stop the fighting. Who are we to turn away from the cup that we've been given to drink? And it's interesting because when we look at the idea of change, change is always an ending and a beginning. But the problem is that when change first enters our lives, we often can only see the ending, so we naturally resist. When we, when, when we say, like, oh, I don't like change, I'm not good with change, it's because change presents itself as an end. And our ego, our identity is under threat in these moments because we just say, well, this shouldn't be happening. It's an ending to often who we think we are. It's an ending to the way that we think things should be. And so we adopt this Peter mentality and we fight. But I'm curious what it would look like if we could take cue from Jesus and we could let go. We could trust that there is a spring. We could trust that this is part of a larger cycle of rebirth. And yeah, you might think, well, that sounds great in theory, but I don't want to just have false hope. But I really ask you, like, when in your life has it worked to just resist and to fight change? And you're like, that was a good plan. And yet, when in your life has it worked to surrender, to trust, to let go? So we all have areas in our lives, even right now, today, where we're being Peter. We have areas where we're, we're holding out, where we're fighting, where we're resisting life. And the way of Jesus is saying, look, you can let go. You can surrender and trust that there's something greater that is going to come of this. And so I just ask you to think about that. What is an area of your life where you might say, I'm going to put my sword down. I'm going to trust that there is a change happening and that there is something good in here. Maybe, Maybe it's a change in your job. And at first you're like, no way, this is not going to happen. Maybe there's someone in your family that you're like, I just cannot forgive them. I can't let that go. Maybe it's a change in relationship. Maybe it's a dream that you want to hold on to, you don't want to let go of. But if you could just let go of a particular dream in a particular form, you might make space for a whole new dream to enter your life. So what I want to do is I just want to create a couple moments. You might have noticed a blue sheet of paper 
in front of you. Um, there's a reason why every piece of paper looks a little different. Um, it's because we're all unique as human. No, I'm just kidding. It's actually because I'm the worst craft person of all time. <laughs> I wanted to pull a fast one and be like, there's a symbol there. No, I'm just terrible at, at, at cutting. But um, I want to give you just give us, because I'm going to do this as well, I want to give us just a, a couple of minutes where we can really take a moment, reflect on something in your life that you feel like you're just holding on and it's inviting you, just let go. Just let go. It's okay. Just let go. It can be big. It can be small. But just something that you know, if you could write it down on a piece of paper, that you would in, in, one, in some way create an act of just releasing it, of just letting it go. If you just drop it into this jar, it's like a way of physically embodying the act of releasing it, of saying, it's okay. I release you. I release myself so often. It's guilt and it's being so hard on ourselves. So I want to just give you a few minutes. Think about what that might be for you. Write it down. And if you feel so called, you can come up and drop it in this jar. So someone asked me, are you going to burn these? Um, I, I will... In one way or another, I will make sure to destroy this for us, and I will film it and put it on social media. So that way you know that the thing that you released, it was, it's gone. It's clouds now, you know. But uh, we're going to close here, and um, at this moment, I'm going to invite our ushers. They're just going to come around. If you want to give um, physically in person, they're going to come around with our baskets. If you want to give online, you can do that at loveperiod.org. Org. We have our pledge, um, which is also available online, or you can just drop something in the boxes at the back. If you're new, too, I want to invite you to fill out a card. Um, we'd love to get in touch with you, and we have um, just emails that go out each week letting you know what we're up to. And so if you want to fill one of those out, drop it in the box at the back. We'd love that. And lastly, um, as, you, as you exit out, um, we, just like last week, um, we have a station set up there are cards um, for a member of our community, Bonnie Miller, who's going through cancer right now. And if you would love to send her uh, just a, a loving message, there are cards on the tables out in the back. And if you want to be a part of a meal train for her, you can let Robin know. Um, but this act of dropping these things in this jar, we're now moving from Friday into Saturday. Sunday... The Sunday moment is on its way. Easter is coming. But right now, we're going from Friday into Saturday. And the invitation of Saturday is this. It's a liminal space. It's an in-between space. And this is often uncomfortable for us. It's often uncomfortable for us to leave an old thing and the new thing has not yet arrived. We're in this really uncomfortable stage as a world right now you know, the last couple of years broke down a lot of systems in our world. They showed us the failings of a lot of systems. And yet the new way has not yet fully presented itself. So we're sitting in this uncomfortable limbo, this liminal space. Yet what's interesting about the Saturday between the Friday and Sunday of Easter is that this Saturday is called Holy Saturday. You have Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. And Holy Saturday is also known in some traditions as the Great Sabbath. In some sense, it's a, it's a great moment and day of rest. And so I would just encourage you to look at your own life, look at some places where you might be in a Holy Saturday. Maybe the, the kids just moved out, and you're like, I don't know what's next. Maybe you just retired, and you're waiting for something new to come in to kind of fill that vacancy. But what if you could see this moment as the great Sabbath? That between now and next week, you can just sit in that space. You could sit in that emptiness. And instead of seeing that emptiness as a lack, what if you could see it as a space of infinite possibility, of infinite potential? So I'd encourage you to just sit in that for just a moment and take that with you throughout this next week. We're going to go into our discussion groups. 
Before we do, I do want to just let you know, we have uh, a bunch of Aldea t-shirts at the back that we are going to be, you can take. We're giving them away for free. We have a bunch of different sizes, and I encourage you, if you're going to join us next week, to wear that shirt. That way, if new people come, they're like, cool, we have merch, you know, like they, they know what they're doing. So go ahead and take one of those before you leave. But before that, we're going to enter into our discussion groups. And here are the questions for us today. Are there any areas of your life that you have pruned in order to let other areas grow? And second, what are the liminal spaces in your life? In what areas are you experiencing a holy Saturday? All right. 